take two <laughs> of Arctur Monologues. I'm Dean McClung. I had, a, I had a false start there, and I had this begin again, because um, I got distracted, and uh, so I had to stop and say, shit, and then start over again. <clears throat> When it comes down to it, uh, when I think about it, now that I think about it, now that I think about it, the the program that I was recording before this one um, was it was pretty calm, and I was calm. This is it, rational, speaking to you in a normal tone, as I am now, not ranting and raving. And uh, I was being civilized. I was talking about my name. Um, I've got several names, by the way. So if I can focus and keep myself on the right track and just stick to one thing, I could probably get through the whole show about 45 minutes and follow a pattern of thought that is consistent and directed towards a particular topic and uh, expounding on a particular topic. Now that's not to say that I have to do the whole show on one particular topic. I can talk about several different things on the show. I can talk about one thing and then talk about something else and then even come back to the first thing. The problem with that is that people <clears throat> might think that I am rambling, that I am kind of branching off into different areas, going here, going there, and jumping around, and, and they might think that I have like a short attention span, which has been given a bad rap because oh, you got a short attention span, meaning you know you're not very bright. For example, um, that's not necessarily true. And older people sometimes they get uh, a little forgetful uh, for one reason or another. They become well. The old word used to be. Uh, I guess that still used is uh, senile. Senile meaning forgetful, um, they get a little bumbly in their conversation and they and they uh, lose track of where they were in, in, in the conversation and other symptoms. <coughs> I think medical science understands why that happens and how that happens and um, in some cases they can treat that to some degree. I think there's probably uh, exercises that individuals can employ to help themselves kind of compensate for the the aging process and the uh, the mental uh, deterioration that people go through to various degrees as they get older and I'm talking about Oh, I don't want to say the word senior citizen. As they get to be elderly, now I'm not suggesting that I'm elderly. <clears throat> I am old, er, um, <laughs> old er than I used to be, and old er than a lot of human beings that are now alive 
that weren't alive when I was born. There are people of every age increment from zero to well if you're zero you wouldn't be born yet right <clears throat> okay so let's call it point zero one to um, over a hundred years old living right now who <laughs> who may not be living by the time I get done with this this episode of the show. Which is sad. But, that's nature. People are born, people live, people die. That's just the way it is. I don't like it. <laughs> Particularly for me, in my case, I, I'm not too fond of the idea of dying. Um, I think I would probably be considered mentally ill if I denied that that were going to happen, was going to happen, um, to think, oh, I'm not going to die, I'm immortal, I'm going to live forever. Uh, that would be probably delusional, probably be classified as just a bit out of my mind, because, you know, not going to happen. Everybody that's ever lived has died. At some point, sooner or later, young or old. And uh, that's sad, but that's the reality of it. And I'm closer to being dead now than I've ever been in my life. Even though, to be honest, there are other people who have been closer to death than I have. <clears throat> At a younger age than I am, for example. Um, some people have gone off to war. Every generation in America, at least, <clears throat> has pretty much been involved in some war activity since the Union was formed back in the uh, 1700s. Late 1700s. Uh, I think that's telling about a society that can go to war like every generation or as we are now in America today and have been for at least the past 15 years been at war constantly <clears throat> I mean on a daily basis since that piece of shit George W. Bush um, we've been living in a state of war with pretty much everybody on the planet certainly those Middle Eastern countries and so on um, all because of some <clears throat> heinous act of terrorism that uh, happened. You know what I'm talking about. 9-11. And i just point out here something to you. In case, you know, you're like living in a coma and just woke up like Rip Van Winkle and you just woke up and found out, that, oh, what's going on? And uh, then you say, oh. And I say, uh, we're in a state of constant war the American government has put us in jeopardy, at risk of extinction by doing things that are insane. Criminally insane. And then there's the conspiracies. Now, you know, people like say this sometimes and I think, you know, how sad that they are that stupid and naive, gullible, manipulated, brainwashed, whatever, that they should suggest that, oh, you're just a conspiracy theory nut. Um, you know, if they just said conspiracy theory person, then I would be fine. But they add the nut part on there. And that just 
screws up their total credibility right now. It's just think gone, done. You're just you know. I think we know who the nutters are. All right. So the uh, George Bush, he, he uh, I'm not going to get into the whole 9/11 thing. You know, I think everybody's seen something about this, read about it on the internet. <clears throat> You know about the theories that uh, George W. had something to do with 9/11, which of course he did. He was president during that time, so obviously and naturally he would be associated with that event and that time period. What what I'm talking, what I'm concerned about here is the fact that George W. Bush began, at least more more in depth and more intense war against the world pretty much even though other presidents and other government entities politicians have been working towards this world war perpetual war <clears throat> for decades George Bush by the way just just for the record I think George Bush, George W. Bush, and the whole mafia, the whole Bush mafia, is guilty of crimes against humanity, uh, among other things, mass murder, genocide, treason, you know, anti-freedom, anti-nature, anti-intellectual criminal evil things and uh, I think that George W. Bush for one among others and you probably know who those others are like Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and so on I think that they have committed crimes I think the evidence is clear that they, have, that they are guilty of heinous crimes against humanity among other things and that they deserve to be treated like the uh, animals, barbarians, uh, criminals, traitors that they are. Now, I don't say that in the sense of saying, oh, well, they might be criminals, or it's my opinion they're criminals. They are fucking criminals. And there's no doubt. There's no question. There's no debate there. The evidence is overwhelming. And this is one of the things about Americans that I really, it befuddles me. You know, I talk to people, lots of people. I talk to people all over the world, actually. Communicate with them, back and forth, and so on. <clears throat> Thanks to the internet, which is a wonderful thing. Which can be used to hurt people, by the way. As I was beginning to tell you before. The point is, you know, George Bush and his criminal gang... Um, how do I say this? Should I be tactful? Should I be... Uh, I don't want to be politically correct. That makes me gag. Um, let's just say... People who engage in such heinous crimes against humanity... <clears throat> among all the other crimes that he committed... That deserve to be held accountable should be held accountable and we should hold them accountable because they committed evil criminal things. I mean heinous crimes against humanity and against the Constitution and America and the country and so on and Americans and so on and so on and so on. And like I said, this is not my opinion. The evidence is there. Anybody that's conscious that you know doesn't have their head up their ass for the past 15 or 16 years knows for that what I'm saying is true. I'm not going to get into the conspiracy theory type things even though there's nothing wrong with a conspiracy theory, particularly if the theory turns out to be true. <clears throat> a lot of times you get these people that say oh, you're a conspiracy theory nut. Like, uh, I'm not a nut. I mean, I'm not mentally impaired. I'm highly intelligent, actually. And quite logical. I resort to reason 
um, pretty much on a constant basis. And I'm good at it. Um, this thing about calling people a nut, and, and then there's on the internet, it's very common. You know, the, oh, you're an idiot. You're a moron. Those are some of the nicer words people use to describe other people that they don't even know. <laughs> you know, based upon the delusions or the uh, ignorance of the people calling someone a name. Uh, you know, like, oh, oh, you know, you don't agree with my theory. You don't agree with my statement. You don't agree with the facts. The facts. You don't agree with the facts. I mean, how can you not agree with the facts? You know, the sky is, you know, up. <laughs> That's not my opinion. And by the way, your opinion is not equal to my opinion. It's not. You're not. Equal to me. And I kind of got off on a little tangent there, but this is all important. I give you a little dose of different things, a little taste of this, a little taste of that as we go along, and that's sort of like my style. <clears throat> That's not to say that I cannot write a whole book on one subject. Uh, have, and uh, will continue to do so. But here's the thing. If you're going to call someone an idiot, and the thing about the internet is you, you can actually do it, and you think you can get away with it, you think, oh, there's no consequences. I'm like anonymous. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows where I live. As if you know, you can't be discovered. As if your you know IP address is not uh, there to be seen. And some people can read your IP address and discover who you are, where you are, at any given time. More people than just the government can do that. Of course, the government can, and they probably shouldn't be because they're not allowed to do that. It's called. Uh, against the law, a crime. And the fact that Americans allow such things to continue is, is mind-boggling. I mean, I don't do anything directly to put an end to the Nazi bastard police state motherfuckers uh, doing their thing against us, violating our rights, our human rights, our existence, and, you know, killing us in the streets of America, for example. Not to mention murdering innocent men, women, and children in foreign countries, which is a crime. So, the thing is, if you're going to call someone an idiot on the internet, and you're oh, it's anonymous, no one knows who I am, you know, and you might not even be using your real name. You can be traced, you can be found, you can be discovered, and guess what? You can be killed. <laughs> Bam! Dead. Uh, now, I'm not going to do that to anyone. I just, not, it's not my nature to murder people. Now, remember, I said that, okay? It is not my nature, it is not my makeup as a human being to just murder somebody. I consider that a heinous crime. I also consider it insane. So if somebody is, let's say, somebody is, uh, say, say somebody shoots somebody, dead, you know, like a stranger, or even uh, someone they know, and this happens a lot, uh, in other places besides America, but let's just kind of stick with America here at this point. Suppose somebody shoots somebody in the face, then they're dead. And they're charged with murder, and they're convicted in court of law. The evidence is presented, the witnesses come forward, and that person is declared. <laughs> and sometimes they have a little thing, you know, like a hearing or a little little process called uh, uh, determining whether that person is um, sane and um, qualified to be tried if, if that person is sane and capable of 
you know, being aware of the fact that he's being tried for murder, a heinous crime, and that he could be put to death, or at least life in prison, depending on what state you're in. Um, you know, so there you are, and they're put on trial, and they're convicted, the jury, 12 fine people, who I would hope understand the concept of jury nullification, uh, another story there, but convicted, and so we, we can now determine that this person has been found guilty in a fair trial. Yeah, get one of those in America. Uh, then that person is sentenced to prison, let's say, not necessarily execution, but uh, death penalty, but depending on the state, like I said, uh, that you live in, suppose that person is then convicted and, uh, and sentenced to prison for life or execution, depending on what state you're in, like I said. And we can say, hmm, that person is guilty. That person has committed a heinous crime. And, you know, a lot of times, and I, this is what, this is the point I'm trying to make. We think that those people have been found guilty of willfully, knowledgeably, intelligently committing murder. It's just some sort of assumption that if you killed someone, you shot them in the face and killed them, you know, over some petty little argument or what have you. Or because, you know, they happen to be, like, in a foreign country and your government says, you know, drop a bomb on them from your drone, sergeant, or whatever. Uh, just assume that person is sane. They're just bad people, but they should be punished for their crime. Their bad behavior. Okay, here's my take on this. If you kill someone in cold blood, if you knowingly, knowledgeably say, you know, I'm going to take this gun and bang, you're right in the face with it. You know, bam, you're dead. Your brain explodes all over the wall. <clears throat> and, or stabs, or whatever. Or blow someone up with a bomb. Here's my contention on that. You're insane. Because no sane person would do such a thing. Now, you might suggest that that's my opinion. But it's a learned opinion. It's a knowledgeable opinion. And it raises to the level, almost, and maybe actually does raise to the level of not an opinion, but an observation, a critical analytic observation of what is there to be seen. Um, how does one come to a conclusion? Well, by calculated, logical thinking, you come to a logical conclusion, a factual conclusion. You have to consider the evidence. You have to consider the facts. You have to be able to think logically. I think every human being can think logically to some degree. Unless you're in a coma. Or brain dead. But I sometimes think that most Americans are brain dead. <clears throat> that would probably be an opinion. The evidence does seem to support a conclusion, a logical, factual conclusion is that a lot of people in America are mm, retarded and delusional, which is a symptom of insanity. So, we can conclude from knowing what we know about human beings, human nature, and the functioning of the human brain, and we know quite a bit. I don't know everything, but there are other people that are experts on the brain and the functioning of the brain and thinking and processes of intelligent thought and so forth. So when someone calls someone an idiot on the internet, they're it's a slur, isn't it? It's like calling someone the N-word. 
you know, before I said that, I was actually going to say the word. And knowing the uh, hysteria that saying that word uh, causes, um, I choose at this point not to use the word. I choose not to say the word out loud, even though it's a legitimate word, and it's just a word, and it only means what people what people put to it as a, as a meaning. For example, the N-word. <laughs> you know, you know I'm going to say it, don't you? Uh, the N-word, for example, is simply a, a valid, in some languages, a valid word, such as... Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it in English. Maybe I can pronounce it in... I'm not even sure how to pronounce it in German or in, uh, let's say, European or French. The word black in some European languages is negra. Um, I said that real low, like I'm afraid to say it out loud. Um, I'll spell it N I G R E. That word is French for black. So in France, I'm guessing that people who live in France, who are born in France, live in France, speak French, if they're talking about black folk in their country, for example, you know, they're fellow French persons, and there are black folk living in France, and the guy is describing someone that he knows who has a dark skin, such as black skin, which is actually very rare, in European cup in America, for example, I, I rarely, I've rarely in my life seen a truly black person. Um, when I was in college, I saw a couple black people, and they were from the depths of Africa, and I couldn't tell you at this point what country they were from. I don't remember. It's been a long time ago, over forty years ago. And to be honest with you, I haven't seen too many black folks since. I mean black people with black skin. As opposed to, you know... I should probably look up the word in I-G-R-E in the dictionary, in the you know, French dictionary and so on, to learn how to pronounce that word properly. Um, but if a France, French person living in France sees a guy walking down the street or has a neighbor or is buddies with or happens to be a darker skinned person than a white person or Caucasian, he might describe that person like let's say he was mugged and you know caused the cops and the cops uh, describe to us the person who uh, robbed you. And uh, you say, Well, uh, that person is I'm not speaking French. Uh, it's not a French accent. It's just never mind. Okay, on with the story. So the guy says, uh, the guy who uh, did rob me say is, um, he is about five foot two inches tall, five foot two inches tall, and a very short person, and he happens to be of dark skin, uh, that is to say, he is negra colored, his skin, that is. Anyway, <laughs> I just find it amusing that in some countries, some societies with a different language, like French and so forth, would actually say the N-word in a very innocent way by describing, you know, a color that they know. Um, what would what would a French person say, or an Italian person, or a Russian person call a person who is not black skin but brown skin? A uh, German person might say, uh, Well, the... No, I can't do that. Can't do that now. Um, and my, my, my companion, wife, if you like to call her that, uh, is actually half German and speaks German fluently. So if I wanted to know how to say something in German, I simply ask her and she'll tell me. Um, 
she doesn't speak German at home in the house here, except unless she's talking to her family members in Germany on Skype or whatever. Uh, but what I'm saying, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that in France, the N word is used as a common word to describe a color. Like if you have a, um, say you have a car, an automobile, and you're in France, and you uh, and it's black, by American standards, black, meaning black, not brown. You, the French person, would use the N word, <laughs> Nagra. Uh, you have to imagine that in a French accent. You know, I I can't do one right now. Um, and he just called the car the N word because it's black. If he was calling if, in Germany, if you were calling a brown car, describing a brown car, you would say a brown car. <laughs> It'd be kind of silly to call a brown car black when it's not. So my point there, if you if you're paying attention and you've been following me along and you're kind of like maybe getting ahead of me a little bit, you're saying uh, so. Calling a brown person a black person is pretty much illogical uh, and just not accurate. So if I was mugged, let's say, getting back to that example, if I was mugged and I'm in America, and I call, you know, please come and uh, describe the assailant, and I say, well, he was uh, male, he was about five. Nine. He weighed approximately 195 pounds. That's a pretty accurate description. I mean, that's pretty precise. I don't know. He could have been 110 for 210 for all that. I'm just guessing. And uh, and then I and he was uh, he was a uh, brown person. Let's uh, say so he had. Oh, let's try it out loud. All right, hold on. Yeah, wrong number. <laughs> All right. Um, why would you call somebody a black black when they're not black? And see the this idea of assigning a color to a race of people. And by the way, race is the difference in spe you know a subspecies. Why would you call someone black when they're brown? Because oh, we call them black people now because. We can't call them the N-word. Even though the N-word is, means, black. Now you, you're thinking, oh, I, I'm trying to justify using the N-word. Which, if you spell it N-I-G-G-E-R, is a racial slur. But the word itself is just a word. And if you spell it G-E-R, uh, yeah, you could say that. But my point is not with that. My point is with the fact that the word means what it means. And the word black is is pronounced and spelled differently in other countries and other languages. And uh, black means black. So, negra means black. And if black is black, and that is, you know, why would a Frenchman describe a black person any other way than to say they're black. And why would anybody in France, for example, say, ah, I'm talking about the African person who happens to be brown. Wouldn't you call him brown? If you're in Europe. Because their mindset's a little different. Their educational processes and learning processes are a little different than in America where, you know, I'm not going to say yes, no, or good or bad, right or wrong, but I'm guessing European people, young ones, are educated just a little differently than they are in America, where we are subjected to lies, false things, and uh, brainwashing, so to speak, indoctrination, they like to use the word indoctrination. Now, the brainwashing word kind of went out of vogue when the Russians 
uh, when the Cold War kind of you know ended, and what was that, eighty nine or seventy nine? Eighty nine, maybe. In that time period, somewhere. So, calling someone a black person to me, it's just kind of silly. But you're going to object and say, oh, that's because they're Africans and Africans are black. And that brown is close enough. Um, calling me a white person, uh, you know, if I was an albino, maybe. Now you're saying, oh, you're being picky, picky, picky. And yes, I am, because people need to be picky. They need to be critical thinkers. They need to be able to think, reason, logically, rationally, be factual in their thinking. I'm not saying you have to be absolutely logical and never emotional. You have emotions, and there are times for being emotional. You can, like, when I'm ranting, which I did yesterday on the show, you could rant, you can be highly emotional, you can be distraught, be upset, angry, and yet at the same time, I can be civilized, like I am now. It's a matter of choice. The question here is, do you control your emotions or do they control you? This is uh, an important part of that facet. So, what I was, what I, I think you get the idea the just of what I've been saying, and uh, so I'm not going to say any more here. I'm going to end the show uh, at this point, uh, and just think about some of the things I've said. And I've said several things. I've put several points to consider: language, social, cultural differences. Uh, words mean what they mean, and uh, so forth and so on. So, if, if you didn't catch the drift of all of it, listen to the show again. It won't hurt you. It's only 37 minutes long in county. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to stop now and uh, post this on the internet. Uh, okay, so here it is. and uh, So, I'm going to have to say Goodbye for today. Goodbye for now. Maybe I'll do another show episode later on. So, thank you very much. This is D. McClung, Arctic Monologues, and uh, we'll catch you later. All right.